Okay, let me tell you about one of my favorite movies. One of my favorite movies underneath uh, The Princess Bride. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I, when I put it out there that I was going to start this series called Church and State, I wanted to put under, uh, underneath it when I posted it to say, in, in the words of that great theologian Inigo Montoya, I do not think it means what you think it means. Some of you came expecting to hear something. Uh, you may or may not be uh, disappointed, but I can assure you that everything we're going to say today is God's word. Now, why did I bring that up? Oh, yeah, my favorite movie. So one of my favorite movies is National Treasure. I love history. I especially love American history. And, of course, it's, a, it's just a movie, and it's a story about this guy played by Nicolas Cage uh, who is on this treasure hunt. And this fascinating premise is that there is a treasure map on the back of the, U of the United States. It was a Declaration of Independence? Yeah, on the back of the Declaration of Independence. So there's all of these clues that they have to find in order to find this treasure. One of the clues that they find is a set of glasses. You guys remember this? You know what I'm talking about? And it was kind of funky looking glasses. When he put the glasses on... He could read the map. But without the glasses, they could not see the treasure map. Okay? So they had to have a special set of glasses in order to understand the direction they should go. Well, for Christians, we need to have a set of glasses on to understand the Bible. And these glasses should be through the lens of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you're going to understand the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, the law of God, and all those sacrifices, you're not going to understand it unless you look through the lens of the cross. If you're going to understand the New Testament and all the things that God says to do, like loving your enemies, we're going to get to that here in just a moment, how, how do we even begin to understand that? If we look through the eyes of the cross... We'll understand. All of it, everything will begin to come into focus. And by the way, that's how you understand marriage is through the lens of the cross. This is how we understand family and relationships through the lens of the cross. I think far too many of us are trying to read the Bible. We're trying to make sense of Christianity without looking through these lenses through the eyes of the cross. And I'm going to take these off so I don't fall off the stage, okay? Are you with me today? So today, we want to be looking through the eyes of the cross when it comes to government and politics and leadership. Do you think the Bible might have something to say about those things? The answer is yes. So today, we're going to begin a very short two-week series called Church and State. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at government through the eyes of the cross, now, let me just say that this is a foundational message. Everybody say foundation. If you've ever built a house uh, or if you've ever built a building, you know that digging the hole in the ground is one of the most important parts of the building, and it can take the longest. I heard one contractor tell me years ago, it takes longer to build under the ground than it does to build above the ground. And how many understand the foundation is very important. However, the foundation is the least exciting part of the construction project. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to dig the foundation. Some of you are like, Pastor, when's the good stuff coming? I promise it's all good. But today, we're going to do some digging. So you got to use your shovel. You got to follow in your Bible. We made, we made these message notes available, and I was tempted to make this like four-page notes because there's so much scripture we're going to talk about here today. Uh, but I want to encourage you to, be, uh, to have that, that frame of mind, that mindset of why we're doing what we're doing. Now, I think this is important because, and some of you may ask, why, why, are, we, why are you taking the time to even talk about this when there's so many other things we could talk about? Well, you may, uh, may have noticed this is an election year. Right? It's kind of a big deal. The general election's in November, but the primary is May, May 7th for Indiana, and we see the election signs everywhere. Early voting has already started for the primary, right? And so my heart as your pastor is to disciple you through this, 
to equip you because let's just be honest, in 2020, the church of Jesus Christ in America, we did not handle this very well. And for a lot of us, we actually damaged our witness to lost people because we didn't quite understand how this is supposed to work, the relationship between the church and the state. Are you with me? Uh, so we live in an unprecedented time of deception and, and misinformation uh, between social media and, and all the different news outlets. My, my son, Elliot, is 23. He's on our team, and we were having a conversation last week. He said, Dad, why is everything on social media, social media against Israel? He goes, I don't see anything pro-Israel. I see everything anti-Israel when it comes to the current uh, situation in the world. I said, Elliot, you got to understand that the vast majority of people who are in charge of social media uh, lean a certain way against Israel. Uh, many of them are philosophically and some geopolitically aligned against Israel. And, and you do know, everybody, that not everything you see on social media is random. Somebody is in charge of the information you're seeing. And it is tailor-made for you. Yes, you are being manipulated. All of us are. Now, uh, let me give credit to Jeff Little, our resident worldview ex uh, expert. I filtered this message through him. Okay. All right? Uh, because I, ne I needed some help. And one of the things he pointed out, he said, Pastor Wayne, don't forget, there's a lot of good stuff on social media uh, but it is hard to find. The lies are free, <laughs> is what he said. But, but it, there's a lot, so I'm not saying it's all bad, we should all get rid of it. I'm saying we gotta, be, we gotta pay attention, right? And, and, and here's, today what I wanna encourage you is, is to hear that government is God's idea, yeah. right? And his plan is always the best plan. And again, I want us to see government through the eyes of the cross, right. not through the eyes of, Wayne Murray, or Grace Assembly of God, let's see government, what the Bible has to say. Is that okay? And so uh, I think the best place to start here is Romans chapter 12 and Romans 13. Remember Paul's letter to the Roman church, uh, he had spent a number of years in prison in Rome, and so he writes this epistle in the New Testament to explain the gospel and its effects in people's lives. And, and the book of Romans is very much foundational to understanding faith. Matter of fact, a lot of times we train people, if you wanna, sh if you wanna share the gospel, we say learn the Romans road. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because the book of Romans is so foundational to our understanding of the gospel. And so Paul lays it out and he's like, this is how you live out the gospel in an ungodly world. And that brings us to Romans chapter 12. Are you ready? Yeah. Verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with the Lord's people who are in need, practice hospitality. How many know that's a lot right there? He's like, this is what you do. This is how you live it out. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. There's a lot of stuff here, right? Don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, give him Roscoe's tacos. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. It says feed him. Now, I would, I would feed my enemies Roscoe's tacos, if you know what I'm saying. 
If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's take a minute. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your word. Give us your revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, these are amazing, challenging, and yes, difficult times for us as believers. So we pray for the wisdom that comes from heaven. We pray for the revelation of God's word. Most of all, God, we pray for your heart toward everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Okay, remember this is foundational. We're digging a foundation, so write this down. The first takeaway from Romans chapter 12 is that evil is to be hated. Evil is to be hated. Verse 9, Paul says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. It's kind of odd that we're commanded to hate something. And yet God says, hate evil. It's kind of odd to see love and hate in the same sentence. But what Paul is saying here is if love is truly sincere, you're going to hate evil. Let me say it this way. To truly love the way God loves is to hate evil. Love does not make excuses for evil. To love as God loves, to love with integrity, means to be morally discerning. Love doesn't condone evil. To compromise with evil is to be incompatible with love. So let me stop for a second. If you're entertaining evil, if you're being entertained by evil, you do not have the love of God in your heart. Please hear me. Because those two things are incompatible with one another. So the Bible says, Paul says, hate evil. Now notice he's not saying hate people. Because how many know hating evil and hating people are two different things? Most of you know Jameson and Kathy Carrier from our church. Two years ago, they lost their son, Joey, who was 38 years old, to a fentanyl poisoning. Now... Some of you know that losing a child might be the deepest pain that anyone can experience in this life. And they walk through that. So much hurt, so much pain there. And their hatred for fentanyl poisoning and the fact that the majority of fentanyl that comes into the U.S. comes across our open borders is a big reason why he's running for Congress. Now, I promise you, because I, I know Jameson, he's, he's on our elder board, he leads Cowboy Church. It's not because he has nothing else to do, right? Uh, but drugs like fentanyl are crossing the border at unprecedented rates, and as a result, there are thousands of families experiencing this same kind of pain every day. So they hate evil because of what it does to people. So they're doing something about it because love hates evil. If you don't hate evil, you don't love anything. The cro Matter of fact, watch this. This is where we see through the lens of the cross. At the cross, we understand how much God hates evil. So violent, so bloody. Why? God hates evil. Because God is love. Are you getting this? This is important. The reason Jesus died is because God hates evil. And how many know we should hate evil too? Number two, Paul says not only do we hate evil, but evil is not to be repaid. To which we say, what? Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. When I was a kid growing up, uh, we used to watch every Friday night Kabuki Theater. Anybody watch Kabuki Theater, these kung fu movies? And, and so they were originally in, you know, 
Korean or Japanese or uh, Chinese, I don't know. But they would be translated into English. It was so funny because their mouths did not match up with the words, right? And so many times the lines went like this, you kill my brother, I kill you. Come on, is anybody, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Great memories. That revenge, getting people back, was the theme of so many of those movies. And it seems right to our sinful nature. And yet God says, don't repay anyone evil for evil. As a matter of fact, to repay evil for evil is to simply add to evil, not take away from it. And if we truly hate evil, why would we add to it? It's going to get quiet in here for a minute, but I want you to stay with me, okay? We're digging a foundation. Remember Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? He said in Matthew 5, don't resist an evil person. And another word for resist is retaliate. Jesus is saying what Paul is saying. Followers of Jesus don't retaliate against evil people. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. Peter said of Jesus, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Now, Paul didn't say that this is going to be easy, because how many know the cross wasn't easy, but it's right, because God's commanded us to do it. How many are still with me? Evil is to be hated, evil is not to be repaid, but number three, Paul says, evil is to be overcome. Verse 21, don't be overcome by evil, overcome evil with what? With good. Good. Now, how do you overcome evil? How do we, uh, another translation says, don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. So Paul says the way to conquer evil is with good. Jesus said in Luke 6, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Paul goes on to say in Romans 12, verse 14, bless those who persecute you. In verse 20, he says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Now, let's, can, we, can we sit here for a second? Why should we be good to people who betray us? Why should we do good to people who slander us, to people who hurt us? And, and let's be honest, some people do it um, maybe not intentionally, but some people do it intentionally. How are we so, how do, does that make sense? You're preaching for me, Bruce. How, how does God expect us to do good to people who insult us, betray us, harm us? Because that's what God did for us at the cross. Paul said in Romans 5, while we were sinners, He died for us. While we were hating him, while we were reviling him, while we were crucifying him, remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago, it's our sin, it's my sin that put Jesus on that cross. And yet he loved me anyway. That's why we gotta see this through the eyes of the cross. It's the power of the cross that gives us the power to do good to those who harm us. Now watch this, Paul says, when we treat our enemies with acts of kindness, or we show them mercy. Don't you love this part? He says, you'll heap burning coals on their head. Now, at first read, that might say, Pastor, that doesn't kind of align with doing good or loving your enemies because it's almost like Jesus is saying, do good stuff so I can watch your hair burn on your head. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what our sinful nature wants. Yeah. I'm going to be nice to you, but only because God's going to burn your hair off your head. That's not consistent with the context of this, is it? So what does he mean by uh, uh, burning coals of fire uh, on your head? Remember in the Old Testament, that uh, form of repentance was ashes. So heaping burning coals on someone's head is a figure of speech for causing an acute sense of shame 
on a person who hurts us, not in order to humiliate them, but to bring them to repentance. Listen closely. The purpose of doing good to those who hurt us, and Paul creates this vision of burning coals on your head, is to bring the same conviction on a person so that they will repent. It's the same conviction that you and I experience at the cross. Watch this. The scripture's on the screen. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. On the cross, God put flaming coals of fire on our head because we didn't deserve it. We hated him and he loved us. And that draws us to repentance. I'm here with me. The, the foundation's getting a little deeper, isn't it? All right? So, uh, the tragedy of repaying evil for evil is what Martin Luther King Jr. called a chain reaction of evil. Here's what he said. Have we not come to such an impasse in the modern world that we must love our enemies or else? The chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, wars producing more wars, must be broken or else we shall be plunged into the dark days in the dark abyss of annihilation. Next week, I'm gonna talk about how we've lost this. The civil rights movement has lost this heart, this approach, and now it's about evil for evil. Good preaching. Our example is the cross, where God willingly bore the scorn of our sin and our shame, right? And that event at the cross has drawn millions, hundreds of millions to saving faith in Jesus Christ and has transformed hearts and lives. I'd like to see the hands of anybody who's been transformed by the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. All right. I'm, I'm watching for the altar call for those of you who haven't reached. All right. Thank God for the cross. Amen. So we're supposed to be like Jesus and do good to those who hurt us. Help us, Jesus. All right, so evil is to be hated, evil is not to be repaid, evil is to be overcome, but watch this, evil is to be punished. Paul doesn't stop listing what we're supposed to do about evil after these three. He goes on to say in Romans verse 19, don't take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath because it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So God says, don't take revenge on people. I'm going to take care of it. God will avenge you. And how many know God's way better at it than we are? So vengeance and retaliation against evil is forbidden by the people of God because God says vengeance is mine. Now, to that we might ask, why does God get to repay and I don't? Deep question. You ready for a deep answer? Because I'm not God. Think about that. Why does God get to take vengeance, but I don't? Listen to this. Because you're not God. You know that, right? You're not equal with God. You're not God. That, that's the spirit of this world. As a matter of fact, to not forgive, to render evil for evil, to retaliate, it's not just the sin of unforgiveness. It's the sin of idolatry. Who do you think you are that you get to be the one to repay evil for evil? Who do you think you are that you can actually choose not to forgive? You think you're God? Do you see this? That's the issue because we're not God. I think this, these verses are so important because it shows God's going to repay evil, which means God's not in favor of the appeasement of evil. Can I tell you that the appeasement of evil is evil? History tells us that Adolf Hitler kept gaining power and influence in the world because the rest of the world, instead of confronting him and taking action against him, it was this idea of appeasement, and he just began to, to get more and more power and almost overtook the entire world. 
right? And, and I think uh, this is why so many evil, maniacal leaders in the world who chant death to America and death to Israel are growing in power because of their appeasement by other world leaders. God does not appease evil. Why? Remember, God is love. And love is incompatible with evil. Okay. At, let me ask you a question. At the cross, did God appease evil or did he punish it? Think about this. At the cross, did God appease evil or did he punish it? He punished it violently, dramatically. But Jesus is the one who received the punishment. Evil was punished at the cross. Are you getting this? This this is powerful. I think so. I'm preaching good to myself. So if evil is to be punished, and God's the only one who can punish evil, the question then becomes, how does God punish evil? Okay, foundation's almost done. Here we go. How does God punish evil? First of all, remember that God will certainly punish every evildoer at the last judgment. Did you know there is going to be a day where every man, woman, teenager, and child who has ever lived will stand before God and give an account of their lives? And we will all be judged before God individually. Pastor, does that include me? Oh, yeah. It's you and it's me. Pause and think about that. You're going to stand before God. And Romans chapter 2, verse 5 says, because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. That sounds like a verse that should be in the Old Testament, except it's not. It's in the New Testament. Let me pause and just say to anybody who is living an evil life and you're dabbling with evil and you're not repentance and maybe you just came across this video feed somehow, some way on social media or YouTube or or wherever and you're like, you you need to pay attention. You may be getting away with it right now. But there will be a day where you're going to pay for what you've done. That's sobering. Nobody gets away with anything ever. Not from an eternal perspective. But what about now, Pastor? How does God punish evil now? Well, first of all, one of the ways that God punishes evil in this present world is the progressive deterioration of a godless society. Hang with me. The consequences of evil is its own punishment. Because when evil is not punished, how many know society suffers? A society deteriorates when wrongdoing goes unpunished. When individuals escape accountability for their harmful actions, how many know it erodes trust? It disrupts the fabric of community life. Now watch this. Conversely, societies that uphold justice and denounce evil, the effect of that is stability and peace and cooperation. This is why Western civilization has experienced the most prosperity in history because it's the most biblical Now, Western civilization is currently deteriorating because we are seeing many examples where evil is not punished. Now, let me give you an example. More and more, we see rogue prosecutors in cities across the nation uh, that are not prosecuting petty crimes, victimless crimes, shoplifting, drug possession. 
Some states, like Illinois, have eliminated cash bail altogether. Predictably, crime rates in these cities have spiked astronomically. And many retail stores, you read the news, I do too, many retail stores are now closing, right? Because they're being robbed blind by shoplifters and, have no, and these people face no consequences whatsoever. Now you say, well, that's a victimless crime. Well, here's the thing. And in those cities, violent crime is going up. The murder rate is going up. In some of these cities, according to one study, uh, murder rates are higher than the annual death tolls suffered by American soldiers in our recent wars. So one of the ways that God punishes evil is by the deterioration of our own society. Okay, you ready? You ready to put the last shovel of dirt on the foundation? I mean, get it out of the foundation, you don't put the dirt back in. How does God punish evil in this world? Write this down. The state. Government. One of the ways that God has chosen to punish evil is through government. Now we're going to go to Romans 13. Romans 12, Paul builds a foundation how to live out the gospel, and then he connects it to government. Are you ready? Verse 1. Let every person, even those who live in Indiana in 2024, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from who? And those that exist have been instituted by who? I mean, no, God's got a plan. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur what? We should be paying attention to this. Okay? For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive approval, for he's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God. An avenger, watch this, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. God's talking about government. The purpose of government is to carry out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Are you with me? Therefore, one must be in what? Subjection. Not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Because of this, you pay taxes. Bummer. I know some of you are like, Pastor, just, tell, just give me a reason. Give me a reason. Give me any reason. No, no, no. Now watch this. Why? Because authorities are ministers of God. Have you noticed that a lot of government leaders have the term minister? attached to it. In some countries, the leader of the country is not called the president, it's the prime minister. A lot of areas of government are called the ministry of this or the ministry of that. Where does that come from? Romans 13. I'm just telling you, you go to your church, you're going to get smarter. That's all I'm saying. All right. As I get smarter, you get smarter. All right. That's a lot of pressure, so... I'm going to strike that. Just get smarter. Okay. Authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So here's what Paul is saying, that God created government to be an agent of his wrath. Dr. Charles Cranfield said this in The Cross of Christ by John Stott. Here's what he said. The state is a partial, anticipatory, provisional manifestation of God's wrath against sin. Martin Luther, the famous Martin Luther, who penned the 95 thesis uh, on the Wittenberg, the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany, began the Reformation. Anybody know the name Martin Luther, where the Lutheran churches find their, right, named after Martin Luther? Martin Luther interpreted these past, the Romans 13 this way. Watch this. He said, the state is the kingdom of God's left hand having a political and temporary responsibility exercising the power of the sword. The church is the kingdom of God's right hand 
having a spiritual responsibility exercised through the power of the gospel. In Paul's viewpoint, God's, God created the state or government to be an agent of his wrath. He created the church to be an agent of the gospel. I'm slowing down. Here's what Jean Lasser said. God has charged the church with the duty of preaching the gospel and the state with the duty of ensuring political order. The Christian is both member of the church and a citizen of the nation. As the former, he must obey God by conforming to the gospel ethic. As to the latter, he must obey God by conforming to the political ethic of which the state is the judge. So God gives the church and the state different responsibilities. And how many know sometimes they overlap? I hope I've made this point very clear to you. In God's mind, the church and the state work together. That's the plan. And this is why we know that there is no such thing as separation of church and state. Come on, somebody. It's not in the Constitution. It's just not there. And, and this is how you know that because so many of them had a biblical framework, not all of them, obviously, but so many of them had a biblical framework. That's what, this is what they had in mind when they wrote the Constitution. I did not say the Constitution is divinely inspired. Do not go away from me saying, oh, this is what we're doing. I did not. I'm saying Romans 13 informed many of them as they wrote the laws of the land. Okay? Now, I think this is why John Jay, who is one of the founders of our country and the first Supreme Court justice, here's what he's credited with saying this, providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and, it's, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Now, you read that in 2024, that is racist. That is so, what, you name ism, whatever from, I think this is what John Jay is saying. He says, you want people in government who see government this way. You want people in government who see government through the lens of the cross, who understand evil and justice. Come on, somebody. I think that's what, he, I think that's what he's saying. Uh, and because government is God's idea, we should have people in government who follow God's plan. Now, remember, God gives the state and the church different responsibilities, but they do overlap. And can I tell you that the church and the state work best when they work together. Now, let me just pause for a second, because some of you, you were nervous when you walked in. And some of you are watching right now, you're like, I just can't wait to pounce on Pastor Wayne. Cancel culture all day long. You're waiting for one gotcha line that you can go put on social media. This is what he said. And you're going to leave out all the context. I go ahead and forgive you, and I bless you. May you have, may you eat Roscoe's tacos for lunch. All right. <laughs> What I am saying is, listen, the church and the government, in God's plan, best plan, work together. Now watch this. Christians are always Christians. There's not a public life for a Christian and a private life. Your private life as a Christian informs your public life. So any politician comes to you and say, well, my, my faith is a very private matter. I'm going to go ahead and say, you probably don't have faith at all. By the way, if you're new to the church, we talk like this. <laughs> I, I believe in grace and truth. Let's, let's talk about things directly. Yes, there are politicians who all of a sudden get saved right before an election. We don't want those people. My faith is very private to me. No, your faith, if your faith is real and authentic, it's going to have a very profound effect on the rest of your life. Right? But, but as a Christian, I'm supposed to love my enemies, always. I'm supposed to pray for those who persecute me, always. And I'm supposed to be kind to everybody, always. But if I'm in a government capacity, I may have a different role with the state. A Christian who is also a police officer may use force to arrest a criminal 
acting as an agent of the government, but in the role of a private citizen cannot use force. A Christian who is a judge may act as an executioner of the state and may sentence a criminal to jail or to death, but as a Christian individual, I do not have that right. Romans 12 and 13, Paul is not saying that evil should be ignored until the day of judgment. He is saying the punishment should be understood by the state as an agent of God's wrath, not by us. I hope you're getting this. Is it appropriate for ordinary citizens to take the law into their own hands? No. Not if you believe the Bible. That's hard for Midwesterners, some of us, to hear that. But that's God's word. So, in fact, we're bringing this in for a landing. Zach, come on out and give them hope. (laughs) Watch this. And I know I've said everything I said is important. This is really important, all right? Because Matthew 16, verse 27, here's what Jesus said. The Son of Man will reward each person according to what he has done. When Jesus was insulted, he didn't insult back. When he suffered, he didn't threaten back. Was Jesus condoning evil by not retaliating? No. Was he appeasing evil by not retaliating? No. What did he do in place of retaliation? This is so good. 1 Peter 2, verse 23. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I think these verses, in these verses, what's being said is that Jesus left judgment to the wrath of God. So even when Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Even when he was giving himself in holy love for our salvation, the necessity of divine judgment of evil was not far from his mind. At the cross, God... God the Father, Jesus the Son, Jesus became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. The very reason that God, the cross happened is because of the presence of evil. So when Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, he wasn't saying, forget about it, God, let it go. No. He says, I'm entrusting wrath to you. This is why in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, you read about the wrath of the Lamb. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 21, chapter 22, when the, when who's the Lamb of God? Jesus, and he unleashes the wrath of God. Because the wrath of God, the justice of God, the mercy of God is all encompassed in this beautiful, amazing, mind-blowing thing called the cross of Jesus. Wow. Wow. It's far deeper than we ever thought. Way more important than just a two-sentence post on social media. We've got to just, we got to sit here. We just got to gaze at the cross. Wow. Wow. Pastor, what about when government is working against the church? What about when the laws that are passed are against God's word. That's next week. I'll be honest, that's next week. But today, 
I think all of us should wrestle with the cross. Matter of fact, would you bow your head for a moment? And, and as we come to the cross together, some of you, you've had evil done to you. Wickedness has happened to you. People have betrayed you. A boss fired you without cause. An ex-wife or an ex-husband just excoriated you on social media. People lied about you. I'm in no way condoning what they did. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. You don't overcome evil with evil. You overcome evil with good. I'm gonna give you a moment, all of us a moment right here, just begin to pray about that. Would you pray through that? Lord, help me to forgive. God, help me to do good. Forgive me for evil thoughts, Forgive me, God. I'm not God. I repent of the sin of idolatry, the thinking I even have the right not to forgive, that I somehow am justified for taking revenge on somebody else. Forgive me, God. I repent. I'm sorry. Wash my hands. Purify my heart, Lord. I pray for your grace. Some of you here today may be struggling with evil habits, evil people, evil actions. You will be punished. Every unrepentant sin will be punished in the last day. Some of you are already experiencing the punishment of evil right now because of the horrible consequences that are happening in your life. I wanna invite you today to repent God, forgive me. God, have mercy on my soul. Give me courage to cut off evil influences from my life, evil entertainment, wicked things, wicked associations, wicked people. Give me courage, God, to stop it. Stop it today in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, you know what, after hearing this message, I may not be right with God. And that's okay. The cross is all about the love of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God. The reality is you can pay for your own sin or you can repent and believe that Jesus paid for your sin. And in response, your act of gratitude is faith in following Jesus. If that's you, would you pray this way? Jesus, come on, pray it out loud. Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me from sin. I've broken your laws. I agree, I'm guilty. Come into my life. From this day forward, I'm yours. I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord and the Savior of my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you go ahead and give God praise for every man and woman?